science redefines the borders between sleep and wakefulness. Yuval Mir, Tel Aviv University. When the Berlin Wall fell, I was a teenager growing up in Haifa, Israel. I remember the events through the music of Pink Floyd, David Bowie and the Scorpions. We spend a third of our lives asleep. That's 25 years. It seems like such a waste of time, doesn't it? Now, since ancient Greece to the 20th century, sleep was viewed as nothingness, as short death. Thomas Edison believed he could eliminate this primitive need to sleep by inventing the light bulb. And around the time that the Berlin Wall fell, Margaret Thatcher said, sleep is for wimps. <laughs> is that really so? Sleep is universal. Each and every animal that's been carefully studied sleeps. Polar bears even emerge from hibernation to catch some sleep. And if we miss sleep, our brain immediately notices and it will compensate with longer and deeper sleep. In fact, over the last 10, 20 years, we've come to realize that brain activity during sleep is essential for proper brain function, to reorganize synaptic connections, and to support memory, attention, immunity, and metabolism. Insufficient sleep immediately affects our mood and our health. It puts us at risk for hypertension, for stroke, diabetes, and it may even accelerate cancer progression. So are we all wimps? Well, sleep is critical for our brain and for our health. Now, the traditional way of studying sleep has been this, with EEG. EEG is a non-invasive way to measure the average electrical activity in the brain. Let me show you what that looks like. Here's about 10 to 15 seconds of brain activity. When you're awake, it's dominated by these fast, high-frequency chaotic patterns. We call this a flat EEG. Once you close your eyes and fall asleep, you're now in stage one. Brain activity has already changed slightly to slower, more high-amplitude waves. Five minutes into sleep, you're in stage two. Now we start seeing these slow waves coming in. 20 minutes into sleep, you're now in stage three, or slow wave sleep. And note how dramatically different brain activity is compared to when you're awake. Now these massive slow waves dominate brain activity. It's like a tsunami. And after about an hour, we enter rapid eye movement, or REM sleep. It's also called paradoxical sleep, because brain activity is switched back to being much like when we're awake, but our body is completely paralyzed. And this is, of course, when we experienced vivid dreaming most frequently. Now, with this, we complete a sleep cycle that lasts about 90 minutes. And you will all complete three, four, or five such cycles tonight. So this is the classical view of sleep. It turns out it is outdated. It's a simplistic view limited by non-invasive technology. Let me show you how more interesting and more complex things are. So if we really want to understand sleep, we must understand slow waves. These are the most important part of sleep, and we must look inside the brain. In the 1990s, it finally became possible to look at what individual nerve cells or neurons were doing during slow waves. And they found that individual neurons alternate between periods of activity and periods of silence. They switch on and off, on and off. And scientists mainly studied this when working with anesthetized animals as a model for sleep. During anesthesia, these waves happen all the time. Many, many neurons switch on and off 
in perfect synchrony. It's like a giant choir, everyone singing in the same voice. So they thought the same happens in sleep, but anesthesia and sleep are not the same. During natural sleep, perfect synchrony is not quite what you find. Let me give you a few examples. So if you train a person on a reaching task with their arm in the evening hours, and then you track brain activity later in sleep, you'll find that in this one region that controls the arm and was busy learning, it shows different, stronger sleep waves than other parts of the brain. And here's another amazing example. When dolphins sleep, they need to be able to continue swimming to reach the surface for air. So they evolved a unique pattern of sleep where one hemisphere or half of the brain is asleep with these slow waves while the other one is awake, controlling the activity of the opposite fin. So it's not always true that sleep is perfectly synchronous waves. We suspected there was much more going on and we needed to check it. So we took on a new approach. We teamed with neurosurgeon Itzhak Fried, who heads a unique setup at the UCLA Medical Center. They treat epilepsy patients that do not respond to available drug therapies. And these patients are implanted with an array of electrodes to measure activity in different brain regions to find out where the seizures are starting from. Patients are hospitalized for over a week. It's a painless procedure. Many volunteer for research. So together with Chiara Cirelli and Giulio Tononi, sleep experts at Wisconsin, we set out to study sleep in these patients at a resolution that was not possible before in humans, looking all the way from scalp EEG to local brain waves and all the way down to the activity of individual neurons. Let me show you what we found. So this is about five, six seconds of scalp EEG when our patient is sleeping. Note that you can't see very strong waves, and this is typically the case during most of the night when we sleep. Now, when we look inside the brain at two different regions, what we saw is that these two regions show these slow on and off waves, but they do so at completely different times. So when the top region is silent, the bottom one is active. A few seconds later, the bottom one is active, and the top one is silent. We discovered that most of these sleep waves and silent periods happen at different times in different brain regions. And this was true not only uh, in humans, but in other mammals and unrelated to epilepsy. Now, uh, here's the EEG of a rat sleeping. When you look at neurons in two separate regions, again, you'll see that they have these slow on and off waves. And again, you'll see that these silent periods are happening at different times in these two brain regions. So since most of the action in sleep happens locally, and it's very difficult to detect it from the outside, we had an idea. What if these local sleep waves happen not only when you're asleep, but also when you're awake and sleep deprived. When your brain desperately needs sleep. In a study led by Vladislav Vyazovsky, who's now at Oxford, we tested this by keeping rats for four hours awake past their normal bedtime. And here's what we found. When they were awake, flat EG, neurons firing continuously. When they were asleep, these slow waves, neurons switching on and off. When they were sleep deprived, again, we saw these sleep waves occurring with silent periods, as if sleep was invading the activity of the waking brain. So could something similar also be going on in humans when we're tired, when we lapse? We asked our epilepsy patients to perform a task where we showed them images of famous people like Claudia Schiffer, is she still famous here? Uh, or the Eiffel Tower, and they had to say as quickly as possible if the picture was a person or not. Now, during daytime hours, not a problem. You flash a picture, they respond. You flash a picture, they respond. But after they were awake all night, they started lapsing. So sometimes you'll show one picture, they respond. You show another picture, 
And it could sometimes take them two or three seconds to press the button. What was happening to brain activity? We focused on the activity of individual neurons that respond to specific pictures. Like this neuron here, it likes the Eiffel Tower. And then we asked, what's different about this neuron's activity when we lapse? And what we found was this. When a person lapses, the neuron lapses, slowing down its response. And at the very same time, sleep waves were detected in those brain regions. So circuits of object recognition and memory associations were dozing off. So this binary view, here's brain activity when you're awake, and that's brain activity when you're asleep, it's outdated. It's more like a complex yin-yang where you can find sleep-like activities during wakefulness. Now, could we also find wake-like activities when we're asleep? One place to look for is during REM sleep dreaming. We wanted to see how similar is brain activity when we dream to when we're awake and we look at the world around us. We focused on these rapid eye movements and detected precisely when they occurred, these green lines, and then looked at individual neurons in the human brain to see what was going on. And we found that every time you move your eyes in a dream, immediately afterwards, neurons in some brain regions, like here, they burst. Just like when you look at a new image or when you imagine it when you're awake. So just like these old slide projectors that switch to the next slide and the next slide, Every time we move our eyes in a dream, our brain is switching to the next dream slide or the next mental image. These findings are refining our view of sleep. It is much more complex than we had thought. And new discoveries keep shaping our view all the time. So where do we go from here? What are the next walls to fall in sleep research? I'd like to highlight three exciting directions. The first one is measuring sleepiness. Sleepiness is a serious issue. 20% of car accidents and near crashes are because of driver fatigue. 28% of drivers admit they have fallen asleep on the wheel this year. In fact, driver fatigue is comparable to drunk driving. Yet, we have no laws against driving when you're tired. And more embarrassing, we don't have yet reliable ways to measure how tired an individual is at any given time. What we'd like to do is to use our recent findings to develop measures of when these local sleep waves are rising and have hit a certain threshold so we can alarm people before they fall asleep to keep them out of danger. The second direction is improving medical diagnosis. In many types of brain disorders, it's extremely difficult to know if something's wrong by measuring brain activity. But when people are asleep, look at these two EEG traces. On the right, you'll see that slow waves are weaker in the frontal lobe. And this is an Alzheimer's patient with PET imaging confirming the accumulation of dangerous plaques. So if we move beyond sleep stages, to look at specific activity patterns in sleep, that's an extremely powerful approach that should improve medical diagnosis in a wide array of disorders from psychiatry through neurodegeneration all the way to autism. Now, the third and final direction is what I'm really passionate about, is what we're focusing on now at the lab, is what I'd like to call, is there anybody in there? We'd like to understand what is different about brain activity when things from the outside make it into our conscious awareness and wake us up. <clears throat> Some people, such as this baby, can sleep through just about anything, even when loud sounds are coming out of the speaker, but others, when we're in stress or in old age, are easily aroused. Why? What's different about brain activity when we wake up? And what type of brain activity makes us aware of the outside world? Being able to measure awareness of our surroundings will be huge. It has important implications. There are many situations when we're not sure if someone is experiencing the world around them. 
like in vegetative patients, during anesthesia, or in old age. Can Klaus hear me when I'll read him newspapers? We hope our research will provide some answers. So as we learn more and more about sleep, we're opening new frontiers that are much more than sleep itself. In fact, sleep is an amazing opportunity to get at fundamental insights about the brain, health and disease, interacting with the world, and the relation between brain activity and consciousness. Thank you very much.